Um, so hello, welcome to the Legal Food Hub's winter webinar series. My name is Mary Egan and I will be moderating this presentation. I'm going to share my screen so you can see some slides. Let's go with this one. Tara and Bill, can you give me a thumbs up so that you see my screen? Perfect. Thank you. All good. Great. All right. So I work for the Legal Food Hub. It's a project of Conservation Law Foundation, and we work to connect farmers, food entrepreneurs, and nonprofits in the food space to pro bono attorney support. If you live in New England or in, or in any of those careers, you are welcome to visit our website, www.legalfoodhub.org, and apply for our services. We'll determine if you're financially eligible, discuss your legal goals, and then work to find an attorney who can assist you for free. We also create educational materials. We have a resource library on our website with brief legal guides and webinars covering various topics. Our legal resources are designed to provide participants with foundational legal knowledge before meeting with an attorney. Follow us on Instagram at Legal Food Hub to be informed when new guides are released or when this webinar gets posted. Today, we will be learning about onboarding employees, the process, common legal traps, and recommended documentation for your new employees. We are joined by Tara Walker and Bill Ware from Bernstein Shirt. Tara is a labor and employment attorney. She has a strong litigation background with experience in federal and state courts involving all aspects of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation cases under state and federal law. Bill Ware is also an attorney in Bernstein Schur's Labor and Employment Group. Bill has represented employers, both large and small, in matters involving the Department of Labor, the Occupational Safety and Health Administrators, state administrative boards, as well as numerous times in both federal and state courts. So we have ample knowledge between the two of these um, presenters. We're so grateful to have them. Feel free to put your questions in the Q&A throughout the presentation and we'll either answer them at the appropriate time or at the very end. With that, I will pass it off to Tara and Bill. Great, thanks so much, Mary. Um, I appreciate that introduction and I'm gonna try to move through these slides fairly quickly because I know we're getting started um, a few minutes late and we've got a lot to go through. Um, and um, I wanna leave time for questions, but if, for those of you who are not on the call when we were discussing Q&A, if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A and we're happy to be interrupted um, throughout the presentation. Mary can let us know if a question's been raised um, and, and we can answer it as we go. Um, Mary mentioned that Bill and I work in both work in Bernstein Schur's um, Labor and Employment Practice Group. We're both located in Portland, Maine, um, but we both represent clients throughout New England. So our presentation today is gonna focus on federal law and laws that we know are common to most New England states. We're not gonna dive too much into Maine or Massachusetts or any of the specific state laws, but we will um, kind of advise you when it's time to check your particular state law on a point. Um, so th this is gonna be a pretty um, quick presentation. We're gonna cover a lot of information. So I hope that people have questions um, and we can make this the most useful um, lunch webinar use of your time. So this first part of our presentation is gonna be on interviewing and hiring. We're just gonna go through traps for the unwary. So these are things that we commonly see come up in the interviewing and hiring process that I think are not intuitive, that can be um, you know, tricky, and you need to know what the law says in order to not uh, run afoul of it. We're gonna talk about the small talk trap. I'll go through that in a, in a few minutes. I'll give you some best practices um, and we'll talk about the importance of job descriptions. Part two is onboarding. <laughs> what happens after that? Um, we're just gonna go through some very basics. If you wanna move to the next slide, very basics on um, forming and documenting the employment relationship and doing that appropriately, making sure you have the forms that you need. Um, so we'll try to keep this pretty basic for people who don't have employees or don't have experience hiring employees, but also um, not lose the rest of our audience who may also already have an established workforce. So we'll go through um, some very common mistakes that people make under the Fair Labor Standards Act. 
Those are minimum wage and overtime laws. We'll talk through some best practices, um, go through those common state law requirements. I think what's really helpful for especially businesses that are particularly small or don't have dedicated HR departments is knowing when you're going to trigger new requirements. Most of them are triggered by employee size. So how many employees do you have? We're gonna cover those um, major thresholds. You don't need to memorize them all, but it's nice to know where the thresholds are. For example, at 15 employees, we trigger these additional requirements. That's a good time to think about, do we have policies? We'll go through those. And then we're gonna talk through some fun hypotheticals that I think will keep, keep things interesting. So feel free to jump in at any time. Um, if you wanna go through the next slide, um, we're gonna start with part one, recruiting and hiring traps. They'll feel free to jump in as you see appropriate. But I wanna discuss first disability related inquiries. In hiring and interviewing, this is something that um, employers run into all the time. Particularly, I think in the post pandemic environment where I'm seeing a lot of this crap up is if there is some confusion or question about the capability for employees to engage in remote work. Is there a remote work opportunity here or do I need to perform all of the work on site? Sometimes that can be framed as an accommodation or a disability related request. So what does the ADA say about um, disability related inquiries? First of all, what are they? A question or series of questions that are likely to elicit information about a disability. That's the EEOC definition. Next slide, please. And what does the Americans with Disabilities Act say? It prohibits you from making disability related inquiries, even if related to the job in the interviewing and hiring process. So generally speaking, this is, um, you know, there are some nuanced exceptions to this, but I want for those of you who do not have a dedicated HR department, the traps for this are myriad and many. Um, so it is best to avoid making any questions, inquiries related or likely to elicit information about an employee's or applicant's disability status, even if they are related to the job. So that's um, a very non-intuitive point. You might have somebody who says, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if I'm capable of doing this job. I don't know if this is something I'll be able to do after I get hired um, and want to talk to you about that in the interviewing process. It is not intuitive to me that you would not engage in those kinds of discussions or that those could be seen as discrimination. But what does the ADA say? You should go through your process of interviewing and hiring people and discuss those questions after you've made an offer of employment. This doesn't mean you can't discuss them at all, but it's trying to get at screening applicants. What the ADA is trying to get at is screening applicants out of the interviewing process where the disability related conversation might um, be, be pretext. So you might say, I'm not hiring you because we don't have a need for, you know, another position at this time, um, when really it was because of the disability related conversation that you had. After you make an offer, then you can discuss and engage the employee in an interactive process where you discuss, okay, what kind of needs do you have? Can you explain to me how you'll be able to do this job? In the interview process, you should avoid those. Next slide. The one exception to that is if there is applicants who need a reasonable accommodation for the interview process. So for example, if somebody uh, wants to engage in a video interview, um, but they're deaf, um, and so they need um, closed captioning on a Zoom, for example, or something that they can read, that might be um, a, an opportunity, it's pretty rare it, it, in all likelihood, but you can discuss um, reasonable accommodations in the interview process pre-offer. Everything else needs to wait and treat that applicant like you would treat anyone else um, for the purposes of interviewing and hiring. Anything you wanna add to that one, Bill? I was, I was gonna say a good way to kind of capture how to think about the, the few topics we're going to talk about for interviewing the initial hiring stage is a lot of the laws are dedicated around not automatically screening out people. 
And so similar with like the ban the box we'll talk about and the disability related uh, questions, whether about, you know, sex, age, religion, they're all designed to not allow employers to, um, you know, automatically screen out people that would otherwise be eligible. And so a good way to think of it is that, you know, these laws are designed to avoid automatic or maybe um, innate um, cues or questions that would screen out people who are otherwise eligible. That's a really good point. And, and we have a question I can see in the Q&A that's related to that. What happens if the applicant brings it up, right? Is that really an automatic or, or you know, screening process if the applicant on their own discloses that they have a disability and they want to talk about it? My advice would be, in general, what you should do is inform that applicant, thank you for sharing that. We follow the ADA or we follow our processes here and we can't discuss you know, your needs or the nature of the position until after we've completed the interviewing process. I appreciate you disclosing that to us. Um, we will go through the interviewing process, make sure you're a good fit for this position. And then I'd be happy to engage with you in that conversation in the post offer setting. If you are ultimately selected and offered the position, we can discuss it then. Um, the a related question is what happens if there are physical labor jobs? such as ability to lift a certain amount of weight, to bend, kneel, walk. Those are really common things that we see in position advertisements. Bill, what happens if you have, do you wanna take this one? What happens if you have real requirements that are needed for that position and you wanna make sure an applicant can perform those? Is there anywhere that that should be written? <laughs> so, so in the application and the job description, which we'll talk about and probably both, um, most commonly, we recommend that, you know, there's some indication or affirmation that um, the applicant is able to perform the essential functions with, of the job if provided reasonable accommodations for disability-related disability, disability reasons. Um, so that's kind of like a pro forma thing, nothing beyond that. Um, now, obviously, the specifics of that is kind of what Tara's getting at in terms of mm -hmm. after the fact. You, you, it's more fact intensive in, in terms of what you exactly do, but that's kind of like a pro forma checkbox you have for any job application or um, job description. You see it all the time in job descriptions, uh, that common statement. It's really important, and we're going to come back to this when we talk about job descriptions, that you do have those requirements listed because that's an objective and that's your evidence that that's an objective you know, standard or requirement of the job, not related to any one specific individual and their ability to do that job. So having that in the job description is really important. And then after the interview process, you'll say you probably saw in our position advertisement, we have a lifting restriction of 30 pounds. Is that something that you're capable to meet? That would be a disability related inquiry. But if we're in the post office, oh, post, we're not in the post office, we're in the post offer situation, <laughs> then you can ask that question. Good questions. All right, next slide, please. The next um, trap for the unwary that I think is very not intuitive, but I see a lot of clients run into are asking about salary history. So if you are on this webinar and you have a application form that you ask people to fill out before they apply to a job with you. I want you to go in, open it up and see if, if this can show up in a number of places. Is there anywhere where you say, for example, list your past positions and what did you get paid there? What was your hourly rate or your salary in that position? Um, desired salary for the most part is still fine. If you wanna ask someone what they would like to make, it's still fine, but there's a gray area in some states. Next slide. A lot of states are just prohibiting that um, any sort of salary background or salary history questions. Um, and this one is Maine, just for an illustrative example, starting in July, 2019, asking that question actually became evidence that there was employment discrimination. And a lot of you might be asking, you know, I this sort of had the same thought process when the law was first passed, discrimination against what? Discrimination on what basis? 
the theory behind a lot of these laws is that there's a disparity, widespread societal disparity of earnings between men and women employees, just generally, may not be any particular workplace, but one of the root causes, the theory goes, um, of that disparity is that lower pay rates and kind of arbitrarily lower salary rates follow people from job to job because of these questions. And so they've taken a hardline approach. This is the case in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Maine. I think New Hampshire has this, but don't quote me, um, that you cannot ask for salary history information in a, in a job application, interview setting. Um, next slide. The next one is ban the box. Bill, do you wanna talk a little bit about what ban the box is? Yeah, so um, a lot of you might have heard, you know, it's it's a movement that's kind of taken hold in a lot of states. Um, this idea of it's called, you know, for short, ban the box, and it's the idea of not to disqualify individuals with criminal histories automatically, um, especially when the criminal record is not relevant to the job requirements. And again, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, in terms of we don't, you know, a lot of states don't want people to be automatically disqualified just because they have a criminal history, especially when it has nothing to do with a given job. Um, and so, you know, years ago, a lot of employers on applications would have, have you ever been convicted of any felony or any criminal history, et cetera, et cetera. And they would automatically be disqualified or they wouldn't be considered. And so the idea is to get them into the door, get an interview, and not automatically be pushed aside. It's not a carte blanche in terms of criminal history not being considered. It's again, that initial stage for most states, I will say, and depending on your state, you know, there could be county requirements, there could be city requirements. There's, there's depending on your state, there could be a few layers. Um, but the idea again, is that on the initial application, they're not automatically disqualified. There are some, um, employers, you know, if you work with kids, um, mm -hmm. some other ones that you have to, by state requirements, uh, you know, ask about certain criminal histories. Each state law kind of spells that out. Um, but just be aware that um, if your application has just generic, um, you know, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Do you have any criminal history? That might be a problem. Now you have your application form out if you use one and you're looking at it for those salary history type questions. Also look at this. It was ubiquitous that those application standard application forms and I'm still finding them all the time. People will send me their standard application forms say, hey, can you take a look at this? And that question is still on there. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Have you ever been convicted of a crime? You should take that off of your application form. Next slide. Um, all right, so there's um, the next um, requirement or trap for the unwary is compliance with immigration law. Um, this one is actually a fairly easy one to navigate if you know what to do. So for some employers, there's a concern that they may be employing somebody who's not authorized to work in the United States. And they may want to ask for documentation or evidence that the employee is allowed to work in the United States. Um, and the way that you do that is to use the federal form I-9. You can just Google that term. If that does not ring any bells for you, Google federal form I-9, and that will bring up the form for you. And if you have more than four employees, you have to collect these um, completed forms from all of your employees after three days of employment. So right when they start, that's part of your onboarding. If you don't use the form, what has happened in the past is that some employers have engaged, I think, albeit well-meaning, wanting to comply with immigration law and making sure people are authorized to work in the United States. I don't want to attribute well-meaning. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't well-meaning, but they have engaged in national origin discrimination. And there is a, quite a high likelihood that asking questions on your own 
would lead someone to be able to claim national origin based discrimination. So you should be using that form, having employees submit the documentation that's listed on that form. And there's lots of guidance out there about if, you know, some people will may bring to you documents that you might not recognize, documents you're not familiar with. There's a lot of guidance out there on what you can accept as evidence of their authorization to work in the United States on that Form I-9. So if you have it, you're in pretty good shape. Next slide. Oh, we went back to ban the box. Sorry about that. <laughs> we could keep going to the next slide. Well, actually, Tara, if it's yeah. okay, there was a question that came in oh, about great. Ban the Box. So maybe we just ask that for now. Um, right, and it's yeah, a great yeah. one. So regarding Ban the Box, if I'm hiring a delivery driver for my farm's products, is it legal for me to ask about their driving record on their application? And then what about in the interview? This is going to be quite state law dependent. So if, for example, in Maine, then asking about the applicant's driving record, for example, do you have a valid driver's license would be fine on the application form. It's especially part of the, um, the, um, the job requirements. So it's relevant. The second part of that question, what about in the interview? Under Maine's law, you could ask questions that are relevant to the job related to criminal history once you got out of the initial application stage. But you wanna check your state law requirements because there's many states that are broader than this. So you just, you can even Google this. I wouldn't, you know, Google what your state is and that ban the box law or um, criminal history employment law. You'll find what the state law requirements are and you can identify, does it have any exceptions? Um, some states prohibit you from asking irrelevant criminal history background, even in the interview process. So you just need to be careful. That answer is gonna depend a little bit um, on the, the particular state law. Next slide. All right, um, so there are several protected classes that we know of and are very familiar with. Race, color, religion. I talked about national origin, disability. There are several, religions on there twice, whoops. Um, there are several of those, however, that I think are not intuitive for people and that are somewhat newer, for example. Um, and those include, so I'm focusing here on things that I think might not necessarily be intuitive for people who don't have somebody with an HR background or a dedicated HR employee or consultant. Those might include things like marital status or familial status. Um, familial status is something that's protected in New York and Maine. Um, and it includes things like having children in the home or custody of minor children. In Maine, it also means having an adult dependent. Those are things that I don't think people typically picture when they're thinking about people who belong to protected classes. I think it's intuitive for us. We all know by now that you don't ask an applicant whether they're pregnant or planning to get pregnant when you're in a job interview. That would be evidence of discrimination or could be evidence of discrimination in that process. But think also about marital status, familial status, or in New York and Maine, again, we have status as a victim of domestic violence. I want to go to the next slide, please. Let's talk about the context in which this might end up arising in the interview process. This is what we call the small talk trap. For most of us, including me, the... Um, temptation in an interview is to really want to get to know somebody. You know, probably many of you are thinking I run a small business. I want to see if this person's going to jive with my team and me and, you know, do we get along? I want to know about them, but you should just be aware. We talked a little bit about um, the um, protected classes that aren't intuitive. Now we can talk about the small talk trap. So usually outside of the context of actual interview questions, when you're saying, what's the worst mistake you ever made? Or why do you think you're qualified for this position? You might ask things like, hey, you know, I saw when you scheduled this that you, you wanted to move it out because you were out of the country for a few weeks. Did you go anywhere fun? Um, you might ask things about, oh, do you have any kids? Do you have, um, are you married? 
just to get to know them. What about where did you go to high school or what year did you graduate from high school? Um, think about, it just behooves you to remember the context that you're in before you engage in this kind of conversational. Doesn't mean you can't engage in it, but just remember. I wanna illustrate this with a call that I recently had from a client. Um, in that interview scenario, someone had done just that. I see that you just came back from, you know, you, you wanted to schedule because you were out of this country, out of the country. And the um, applicant ended up responding, yes, I was in um, France for the, the week. Um, and the interviewer asked, oh, do you have family there? Actually, I don't even think it was France. I think it was Africa, right? So it's something that you might as begin to associate. Do you have family? Is that where you're from? Later on, that applicant was not chosen for the position and they raised this small talk, right? Is that where you're from as evidence that the decision was based on, their concern was that the decision was based on the, the um, inappropriate questioning about where are you from or where are you really from, which some people can interpret um, as being a little bit of a forward or maybe um, leading question around national origin or racial background. So just be careful, realize it's very intuitive but for us to notice that in the context of an interview, you would never say, are you gonna get pregnant? You would never say, we're only hiring married people here. Um, so outside the interview, you may be eliciting that same information just by having the small talk. Again, it doesn't mean don't do it, but be aware of what these questions might elicit. Maybe you wanna be more careful about the kinds of questions that you're asking applicants so that you don't inadvertently make them believe that the decision not to hire them was on the basis of a protected class. Next slide. Tara, someone did double check after they in, they're in the job. Can you ask about having kids, et cetera? Seems like a way to get to know employees as a person. Yeah, absolutely. I think we want to use logic as our best guide here in common sense. You can absolutely get to know your employees. And again, you might even end up asking, you know, relevant questions about um, an employee's background, but you might be more careful about it, right? You might not ask, do you have any kids in the interview? Um, but later on, you might ask that question and it might not, it, it certainly wouldn't necessarily be seen as evidence of discrimination. Often what we see where we end up getting calls from our clients is when the employee is unhappy, something else is happening, right? They're undergoing a performance review that's not very good. They are really on thin ice in terms of maybe on the road to termination. And in that context, that's when these issues tend to get brought up. Great. All right, if you wanna just click through, um, I'll go through the best practices checklist. <laughs> I realize I did some fun animations here. So um, first thing you wanna understand the risks of questions relating to disabilities. We've just talked about that. Understand the risks about asking for salary history, criminal history, and talking about protected classes. That's why you're here. So you can already check that one off. Avoid small talk that would be prohibited if asked in the context of an interview. I think that's a pretty good guide for how you should engage in small talk. Come prepared to interviews. This is a really good one for avoiding um, failure to hire claims for on the basis of a protected class because almost everyone <laughs> belongs to a protected class or another. Um, so if you have job related questions, you keep them consistent from applicant to applicant, you have evidence that the, the decision that you made was based on their answers, not on their individual personal circumstances. Communicate expectations about the job responsibilities. This includes going back to our original question, hey, we, we are expecting that the applicant can successfully be able to stock the shelves or lift these things. Um, that's fine to discuss. You don't wanna ask anybody about their particular medical conditions, but you absolutely can and should talk about what the job will be um, entailing. And we'll talk about job descriptions in a second. When you write them, you should bring them with you um, to the interview. It helps you keep focused on what the job's actually gonna require. 
Um, when in doubt, I have people operations here, HR consultants, your attorney, any of those are really great resources for you. If you have an HR consultant that you work with, you have um, a, a lawyer that you go to, those are who you need to go to about these kinds of questions. I saw an, a, a question in the chat I'm reserving um, for what happens if you want to withdraw someone's candidacy. That's when you want to contact counsel. Um, the person evidently can't do the job and isn't it going to be able to meet those physical requirements. You have obligations before you withdraw that person's offer, including finding them something, a, an open position that they can do. So you want to make sure that you're complying with all those. Keep notes about your decisions um, on the reasons for hiring, that those are not related to any protected classes. Next slide. All right, job descriptions. Bill, do you want to talk a little bit about this? I'm happy to do it as well. Yeah, so job descriptions, we like to say are an employer's best friend because they should spell out everything you imagine the job entails. And most importantly, that means essential functions. Those junk, those functions that are essential in order to perform the job, physical, mental, et cetera, they should all be spelled out there. And perhaps the most important thing we'll note for this is, you know, a lot of time we see um, employers, especially small employers, um, when they come up with a job script for the first time, it's usually pretty good, it's pretty accurate, it, it entails what they want, but they don't update it. And if the job changes or you or the company or um, your, you know, your entity changes and the job changes, you have to update it. And the employee needs to sign an updated job description. We recommend that basically every year a job description should be signed, reviewed, and then include in their personnel file. I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to someone about, you know, what the essential functions of the job are. And we get to the job description and it lists an address that was 20 years old from, from where the company was. That's, 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 that's just setting up more issues that you don't need. Um, and so, you know, and having the employee sign is also a very good way, good practice of making sure there's no dispute that they didn't know that was an essential function or they were not aware they were supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z. So it kind of just helps um, rebut any issues down the line. For those of you who are looking at this and saying, what the heck is the job description? My response to that would be, you created a position advertisement to, to elicit applications. That's basically the bones of what you need to create. Next slide, please. What else should be in a job description? We'll cover that in just a second. But I think if you have the position advertisement, I would start using that as your job description. For, Bill talked about a couple of really important things and I'll just kind of revisit those in a second, that roles that a job description plays, why we tell you that it's your best friend when you're hiring employees. It's legally very important, but it's also from an employee relations perspective, a really important tool that you have as a manager of someone else. Um, it's the first opportunity, and I think a really good opportunity for you to communicate with that employee what you're expecting them to do. You're solidifying it in your own mind, and you're communicating it to them, and having them sign it is evidence that they've received it and understand it. It should also contain, so Bill talked about essential functions. What we're really talking about, let's go back to our questions about ADA and what happens if an applicant can't fulfill one of those physical standards, those parts of the job description we see all the time. This is why those job descriptions contain what I think sometimes can read as very strange language. You must be able to bend, kneel, lift, um, so many pounds, it really is important for you to think about whether any of those physical requirements are essential for the job that you're advertising for, and if they are, to include them. Because if an applicant then does come through this interview process and say, I, you know, I can do all of these things, but I have a back injury and I'm not able to lift more than 20 pounds, there will be dispute. Is it 30 pounds that they need to be lifting or 20 pounds? You know, can they do the job without being able to lift that much? Courts, the human rights commissions in your state, 
legally, they will go back to the job description. If you don't have one, then you haven't done yourself any favors. If you wrote this out and you put 30 pounds in that job description before the applicant applied for the position, that will be evidence that this is essential, that it is not discriminatory of that one particular individual who happened to apply. And that is really probably one of the primary legal reasons why you wanna make sure that these are accurate. The next reason I think you want your job descriptions to be carefully drafted is that some employees may be exempt from overtime or non-exempt. And I'll talk about what that means in just a few minutes, but those should be probably listed on your job descriptions as well. And often a time where you wanna consult um, a counsel to make sure if it's a close call, whether they're exempt or non-exempt, what you should be classifying that position as. Next slide. So we're gonna move into part two on onboarding employees. Um, we've talked a little bit about job descriptions, but now in this context, we're, we've brought someone on, we've communicated what those um, requirements are gonna be, we've advertised the position, and now they are joining your organization or your company, you want them to sign the job description. That's a really important piece. And I think as a regular practice, best practice, just as Bill said, whenever you do reviews on how they're doing, review that job description too. Is it still accurate? You want them to review and sign your employee handbook. If you do not have one of these, then pay very close attention because we're going to talk about how important that is you should at the very least be having policies that prohibit discrimination, that set expectations. And at the very end, you want them to sign an acknowledgement that they've received it and they've read it. I will tell you as somebody who does litigation in employment cases all the time, you will use this. It's a very relevant document to show that somebody has um, knowledge of what your policies are. In that, you wanna maintain the at-will relationship. We'll talk about that. We already talked a little bit about Federal Form I-9. That's something you're gonna to wanna to collect at the very beginning. So put that on your checklist. And then you're gonna compile all these documents and you're gonna keep them. And you're gonna keep them in the employee's file. You Almost every state, in fact, I can say probably of the New England states where I saw attendees are coming from, there's an obligation under every state law to keep an employee's personnel file. You have record keeping requirements for under um, federal law for wage and hour purposes. You wanna keep all that information together. They have the right to access it. So if you didn't keep it, it's a real bear to try to create after they've requested it. Next slide. I wanna just talk briefly, this is its own presentation. Um, Fair Labor Standards Act governs minimum wage and overtime. Each state has its own minimum wage. And in fact, many localities such as cities and counties will have their own minimum wage requirements. There are also certain overtime requirements. I'll give you an example from Portland. We had um, overtime requirements that were tied to a state of emergency at, during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so there are different requirements depending on where you are, but I just want to talk about Fair Labor Standards Act because it's pretty consistent with many state law requirements, um, except for the minimum wage. Most of those are different by now. And classification. So we have independent contractors, exempt employees, non-exempt employees, and agricultural exemptions that are most relevant to this audience. At the outset, I will say that if you are hiring someone that is not a vendor in an outside relationship who has, you know, let's say an IT consultant or an HR consultant that has a business as providing those consultant services, and you are classifying somebody who doesn't fit within that box as an independent contractor, you're running a legal risk. I see rampant misclassification of people who are called independent contractors. And that means that they're given 1099s. There's not workers' compensation taken out for those employees. They're not being paid payroll tax, not being paid on payroll with payroll taxes being withheld. Um, and that can create a lot of legal risk. If you end up with somebody, most often where I see this is somebody who goes to file for unemployment. And then it turns out you've misclassified them as an uh, independent contractor. Yeah, well, can I just offer one thing about the independent contractors? Yeah, a lot a lot of people for this get under the misconception that 
well, we agreed that he or she is an independent contractor. Yeah. That is not a means of saying someone's an independent contractor. We, I mean, we run into this issue so often that we have like what I call our yeah, but list. <laughs> so we have, you know, well, they call themselves an independent contractor. Yeah, but the job to the tut label or title is not dispositive. Um, we have an agreement saying it, same thing. That's not dispositive. Um, they've always been an independent contractor. Past practices are not a means of uh, rectifying what they actually are. So it's just, you know, be very wary of that. You know, if someone if someone's acting as their in fact their own business, then 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 possibly they are. But it's it's a very delicate line, and it's, some of it's a little non-intuitive. Someone comes to you says, "I'm an independent contractor." You're like, "Oh, great," but it, it's it's very fact intensive, and you have to be very careful of that line. That's a really great point. Yeah, we see that. There's a lot of a lot of people who do this, so just be really careful. Um, there, most state laws on employment um, and um, workers' comp will have right on their websites the test that gets used. For most states, it's the economic realities test, and they generally follow the same requirements, although they're phrased differently and in different and important ways. Maine's is one of the most restrictive. Um, in the country, but it looks at, do they bring their own tools? Do they hold themselves out as having an independent business? Um, you know, those are some of the most primary factors to whether somebody is an independent contractor, but you should be looking that up. And in most cases, err on the side of them being an employee. If you misclassify somebody as an em employee and they should have been an independent contractor, there's not really a lot of risk for you. There, you know, they can, um, uh, dispute that or whatever, but they're not losing out on certain rights, such as unemployment um, for that, for being misclassified in that way. Um, and you'll know, I mean, it'll be a true vendor type relationship. Um, and if you don't know, and you're really in question, talk to counsel. Exempt and non-exempt, I wanna talk about just briefly because there's a common misconception here. These are all people who are treated as employees, but certain employees get overtime and certain don't. And what I hear from everyone, not everyone, most people uh, who don't quite understand this is that if somebody is paid on an hourly basis, that they are, that they are eligible for overtime. And if they get a salary, then they are not eligible for overtime. That's partially true, but it is not the full story. There are duties tests. It's under federal law and state law too. It doesn't matter where you are. You have to meet certain duties requirements in order to be eligible for an exemption from overtime. And I wanna say this again, because I, my experience is that people are quite shocked. There is such a thing as a salaried non-exempt employee and they are eligible for overtime, gets calculated based on how many hours they worked divided by how many, um, how much they earned in salary to get your hourly rate basically. And you times that by one and a half, you get time and a half, even if you're on salary. That's if you don't meet these duties tests. So duties tests commonly involve you have to be office-based under the Fair Labor Standards Act. They call them white collar exemptions. You have to be non-manual in your work. That's already gonna rule out, I think, a number of employees who are relevant for the types of, uh, of workers you're going to have. But they're administrative, professional, and executive exemptions. Those are the three most common. I don't wanna to delve too, too far into what they require. But suffice it to say that, you know, unless you're supervising two or more employees or you're performing work internal to the business, in other words, HR, finance, you're probably not going to fall into the exemption status because you don't meet the duties test. But you know, marketing, maybe social media marketing, I've started to see a little bit on the exempt employee side. Um, but I think you want to be very careful and, and solicit a legal opinion on if somebody is working overtime in particular, um, you really want to solicit a legal opinion to determine whether they are exempt. And then there are the agricultural exemptions. Again, this is like a whole day long presentation and we're already taking too much time. But um, if you're if you don't have more than 500 man days, 
um, then you probably um, want to review with council whether somebody is exempt from minimum wage requirements um, or, and then overtime requirements as well if you're close to that line. Next slide. Why is it important? Why do we care? Um, I don't want to scare people, but um, this is probably the one area of the law where I think our, our clients are most vulnerable. Um, so if you get it wrong, then you can owe back wages to employees who should have been getting overtime. And depending on where you live, that it's, it can be at least two years up to in Maine, I think is the longest at six years. Um, so you're talking about a substantial amount of money that they're entitled to. That's something that's not covered by insurance um, and it's subject to the potential for trouble damages and the employees can get attorney's fees. Even if your employees don't bring this up, which they can, they can um, raise this or sue um, to seek back wages. The Department of Labor can raise this. Um, and I, I've seen you know, a fair bit of this um, in recent years where um, the Department of Labor is finding people classified as uh, exempt when they shouldn't be. So-called straight time for overtime, cases, those are, are um, problematic and it can be a lot. <laughs> I don't want to scare people, hundreds of thousands of dollars if you get it wrong, even for just a few employees. So we can kind of click through these qu quickly. Um, the next slides, right? We've just discussed if I'm these common myths, if I'm paying my employees a salary, therefore they're exempt, that is false, right? They have to meet the duties test. Let's talk quickly about the, some of these best practices. Um, perfect, thank you, Mary. Whoop, we'll go back one. Um, so one of the best practices that Bill referenced is reviewing your job descriptions annually. I think that that best goes hand in hand with also conducting reviews of employees annually. So you sit down with them and there are forms online that you can use. You can create your own form. Maybe you're using just the job description to go through how are they doing, that you're documenting, if particularly where performance needs help or restructuring. This is a really great way for you to communicate with the employees that they need improvement in certain areas. As employment attorneys, what we see is this isn't done. An employee has a long history of performance issues, but now we're at the point of termination. And the employee is claiming that the termination takes place because they just found out they were pregnant or because they are 57 years old, for example, and in an age protected category. And the employer is saying, no, 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 this is a long history. I've had issues with this person for years, but it's not documented anywhere. So from our perspective as attorneys trying to represent you in cases like this, that's a really challenging environment because it's almost he said, she said, it's not great evidence that um, you know these issues have been real. So conducting regular reviews is a way to help that. It's also a really good way to manage people. Having an employee handbook, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, if you don't already have it and you are employing people, any people, I would talk to your regular insurance broker about employment practices liability insurance or EPLI. That generally, as I understand it, and states are different. I think this is done on a state-by-state -state basis for insurance companies, is a pretty affordable um, premium cost. So it's not a very expensive form of insurance, but it can provide very much needed reassurance for people when they get into um, litigation from employees that their exposure is limited. Um, so it doesn't cover wage and hour issues, but discrimination, and I know what most of you are thinking, and I've had the same sorts of thoughts, you know, I'm not, I know I'm not going to discriminate, I don't need to pay for insurance to prevent me from discriminating. The single biggest predictor in my experience, maybe Bill has a different take on this, it, of whether somebody's going to sue is if they're upset when they get terminated. It does not matter. You could be the nicest, most, you know, least, most anti-racist, most thoughtful, conscientious person um, about respecting people's protected categories. And that does not matter. If they are upset, they will find a way to challenge your decision. Um, that has borne out in my experience. I don't know, Bill, if you have a different no, take. I think that's exactly right. And the way I kind of sell it to clients is, you know, 
think of yourself with a car insurance. You could be the best driver in the world. You mm -hmm. never had a ticket. You never did anything wrong. But we all know there are bad drivers out there. And sometimes a bad driver coming away force you something to happen. And that's why you have insurance. They're really it's good. Just, it's just a reality of being a business. And so it never hurts to have more insurance. We don't get any kickbacks, by the way. <laughs> I, <laughs> the only reason we bring this up is because I have, and I believe Bill has represented employers who don't have this and it breaks our heart. It's really hard. It's hard for us to send them bills. It's hard for us to watch them be exposed to this because they, you know, we're talking now tens of thousands of dollars for one case. And that's, you know, our time, maybe settlement, even if there's nothing that happened, it's a, it's a frivolous case. We're still talking tens of thousands of dollars that you might only have a $5,000 deductible if you have the insurance. So that's why we bring it up. The last best practice is develop a process and know how to conduct internal investigations, particularly if you have more than a few employees you will get complaints from employees about whether um, somebody has discriminated against them or harassed them or toxic or hostile work environment. Those are triggering obligations for you to do an investigation. And if you don't know that process, then um, you can't conduct one. So it's really helpful to have an under, have a policy, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, and, um, and, and be able to engage in these. Go ahead. Next slide. I want to cover just an, another little checklist. So hopefully after this webinar, you can go back and check your state law requirements. Um, when I talk about workplace postings, I'm not talking about the one on the left that <laughs> just says work hard and be nice to people. I'm talking about postings that are mandatory. Um, so most, like for example, we have a small business um, office in Maine that gives you all of the posters if you just ask for it and you go on their website. Uh, there's a list, it's under federal law and your state laws will have these mandatory postings. Usually they include things like wage and hour laws, harassment protections and discrimination protections. It will include things like breaks um, and, and what employees rights are with respect to breaks. So you need to have an area where you post them. If you're fully remote or some reason people don't come into a shared office, you email them or communicate them in some other way, but those are mandatory to have. So you wanna be able to get those. Breaks, this is something that's often governed by state law. So how often breaks need to occur, for example, being able to have a lunch break or paid breaks, um, those are typically governed by your state's law. So you wanna know what your requirements are to provide those. Another common state law area where you're gonna see obligations for you is providing sexual harassment training. That is probably one of the only obligations that I see for mandatory trainings, no matter who you are. Um, in other words, you might have OSHA training obligations if you're engaged in some sort of hazardous um, work environment, but no matter what kind of business you're in, if you have a certain number of employees, most state laws require you to engage in sexual harassment training. They are available online, but you need to know that if you have this obligation, then you should be doing it. There's also leave laws that apply state by state. These include things like um, leave for victims of domestic violence so that they can go seek a protection from abuse order um, or they can uh, be a witness. Some of them have voting leave. It can be um, lots of different sources that are um, needed, but you need to make sure you have policies on those. And then I wanted to cover the last piece because this is a bit of a newer one. Um, we know about accommodating employees with disabilities, but there's now the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act that's just been passed in Congress. So now you should be going back. I just included this because it's new. If you have accommodation policies that govern employees with disabilities, a lot of times that's all it referred to was disabilities. I've been going back in, in my client's handbooks and just adding pregnant people um, because now uh, there are obligations. If you Again, this depends on how many employees you have. Um, obligations to accommodate people who are pregnant. Next slide. And then we have harassment, discrimination, prevention. I'm gonna go through this somewhat quickly again. Um, this is where we talk about having a handbook. This is really, really important. If you end up with a sexual harassment claim of any kind, the first kind of question that's gonna get asked is, did you have a policy? 
And did you do training? And fortunately or unfortunately, I think smaller businesses tend to be the victims of this. The implication is if once we get to litigation, if you did not have a policy and you did not have any training and you were obligated to do so, it's seen as evidence that you did not know what your requirements are and that you didn't follow them. So uh, rightly or wrongly, fairly or unfairly, in that individual case when an employee has come to claim that they were the victim of sexual harassment, that first question is a really important one. It's context making. If you don't have a policy, it's kind of presumed that you didn't know that you were supposed to protect this employee or you didn't know what your obligations were as an employer. So you wanna have these, they are critical. Um, this is my little internal checklist for what you need to have. Um, a non-discrimination policy. I mean, that's federal, most federal laws and state laws. You have an equal oper equal employment opportunity or non-discrimination policy, anti-harassment. So that prohibits other employees from engaging in harassment. Um, it prevents employees from engaging in harassment of other employees. Sexual harassment, similar, but the policies are different. Um, anti-retaliation, depending on your state law, you may have a whistleblower retaliation obligation, or you may just have retaliation based on making claims under protected discrimination or harassment laws, but you want a policy that prohibits retaliation and you want a policy that governs how employees can make complaints. So that will say something like, and if you want to make a complaint, you go to the owner. If the complaint is about the owner, you can go to this other person and describe what has happened to you. An investigation will take place. We'll make a decision based on the evidence. Those procedures are really important. Um, so I would recommend that you talk to counsel about getting those um, or an HR consultant who can provide you with those policies. And you wanna train people who are investigating on that process. Next slide. So this, we're just going to go through very quickly. This again is my list of um, what's going to be triggered when um, you grow. So if you look at the very top of these next few slides, you'll see the number of employees. So this, these are the state laws that apply if you have just one employee. And just keep in mind what these thresholds are. And what you should ask yourself if you're looking at this list and you have no idea what one of these laws are, then you need to probably ask counsel, do a little research, or perhaps think about retaining a human resources consultant to look at policies for this so that you can become compliant. So even if you have just one employee, most states say that you have to pay minimum wage and overtime. So does the Fair, 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 Fair Labor Standards Act. Most states say you have to comply with non-discrimination laws. You'll see that there are other um, triggers for federal laws for age and disability, usually when you get to 15 employees, but state laws almost always apply even if you only have one employee. They prohibit you from engaging in discrimination. Um, the breaks for nursing mothers, this is one I forgot to mention when I was talking about breaks, but requires you to allow employees who are pumping um, nursing mothers to give um, breaks for being able to express breast milk in the workplace, in a place other than a bathroom, Equal Pay Act. Um, that requires um, equal pay for equal work. This is the federal law. Many states also have a version of this. Prohibits discrimination on the basis of pay or, um, the, in pay or benefits on the basis of sex. Next slide. The next one, you SARA, or the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, that requires you to give certain time off to um, active military or veterans. And OSHA um, regulates workplace health or safety. That will depend on your particular industry, but you should just be aware that those apply. Section 1981 prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, um, even if you have one employee. The National Labor Relations Act, I think there's the common misconception that it only applies if you have a union, but that is not true. Um, National Labor Relations Act applies to everyone, prohibiting you from allowing employees um, to engage in what is protected activity. That's usually talking about um, uh, terms and conditions of employment. So if you have a policy that says employees shall not discuss wages, that is prohibited under the National Labor Relations Act. Even if you only have one employee, Immigration Reform and Control Act, 
that's the I-9s we talked about, requires you to uh, verify and um, document their employment eligibility or work authorization. So if you have the I-9, you can meet that. Fair Credit Reporting Act, I saw somebody ask about um, background checks. You can conduct background checks on people who um, are working with children. Again, you may wanna check your state laws ban the box. Most of the time they don't govern background checks once you've made the offer. Um, but you do have obligations under the Fair Credit Reporting Act to make disclosures about how you're collecting that information and giving an employee applicant the time to um, an opportunity to dispute if a background check is going to disqualify them from employment. Next slide. At 15 employees, that's your first important threshold. You have the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. You have Title VII, but again, I'm gonna kind of gloss over um, discrimination because most state laws apply, even if you only have one. And they mostly require the same things. So Pregnant Workers Fairness Act requires accommodations for people who are pregnant. A lot of state laws are not yet quite there. Some of them are, and I would expect more of them to go this direction, um, but that's triggered at 15 employees. ADA probably also has the state law an analog that triggers that one employee. Genetic Information on Discrimination Act, that also triggers that 15 employees. Next slide. At 20 employees, you have the Age Discrimination and Employment Act prohibiting discrimination against employees over 40 or applicants. And at 50, this is another big threshold. This is where you really are getting large enough that you really ought to have an employment council. You should have somebody really review your handbook. I mean, you should have that before 50, but if you have never had this and you have 50 employees, that's a problem. Um, usually this is where I see a lot of people who have made mistakes about understanding Federal Family Leave Act um, requirements. You have Affordable Care Act insurance requirements because if you're an applicable large employer, um, that's triggered at 50. Next slide. And the last one is at 100, the WARN Act. So this is worker adjustment retraining and notification. When you do a mass layoff, you have to provide 60 days notice. Um, and that's, a, that's an important threshold if you are um, considering layoffs. So I realize that is so much information and we are already at 104, but I have time to stay on and answer any questions. I don't know, Bill, if you if you were in the same boat, maybe we wanna stay on for 10 minutes. Yeah, I said we can just probably go through the questions that are already there um, and if necessary go to hypotheticals, but I think we're gonna have enough questions. So I think, I yeah. I think uh, the last question we didn't answer was someone asked, um, is it tr isn't it true you can't, commit to firing only for good cause about at will status. Um, so in the vast majority of states, employment is, is considered at will, meaning you can terminate anyone's employment for any legal reason. So essentially you can't terminate anyone for any unlawful reason, that means. So you can't turn for those protected classes we were talking about. Um, as long as you don't terminate someone for one of those reasons, and there's some others, but generally that's it. You can terminate uh, any employee for any reason, any lawful reason. Let me see. That's a great question. Um, I know there gets, there can be a lot of confusion around that. And, and the reason I wanted to include that is if you have handbook language, or maybe you send employees an offer letter when you wanna offer them a position, you wanna be really careful just to make sure, you'll see this repeatedly, this is at will, this position is at will. The reason that we ask for that is because you can inadvertently trigger for cause employment by referencing a specific term. We're hiring you for the 2023 season. Um, if you don't specifically say that it's at will, that might implicate that this is actually a for cause situation or that it's an employment contract for a specific duration. So you just want to make sure to reiterate wherever you can that this is at will employment. And so it looks like a few other folks were asking about handbooks, policies, and that and where they can find them. So although there, there are a few free resources, depending on your state. I recommend looking at your state's Department of Labor, your state's um, Small Business Administration might have something, your local Chamber of Commerce might also have something. A lot of times organizations like that will publish things. Um, 
that, you know, updates for uh, employers of 10 or more, 15 or more. Sometimes they'll have um, handbooks they can also provide depending on whether, whether or not you're a member. So those, a lot of those entities will have things to kind of help you along the way. The other um, helpful resource I've sometimes used is what's called Society for Human Resources Management or SHRM, S-H-R-M. <laughs> if you Google them, like SHRM and whatever policy you're looking for, they have a lot of templates online. And um, most of the time, they're pretty good. I will say, in my this is what I tell my clients, having a handbook that's drafted appropriately and is uh, consistent with your state's requirements is worth its weight in gold because it's your instruction manual. How would you ever know how to comply with all these kind of confusing requirements without having something there that dictates how you do it? So um, if you can, I, this is an, uh, an investment that I think is well worth making um, to try to get a really good handbook that has either been reviewed or drafted by a lawyer. I think that's that's a really helpful piece. All right, Bill, did you see any other? I'm just looking uh, through some of these questions I'm deliberately skipping because they get down a rabbit hole, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one general question looking at some of them might be, you know, how do you count temporary employees for purposes of those, some of the laws in terms of like 15 versus 20 versus 50. And so by and large, that's a, very, uh, it depends question. I know that's, you know, unfortunately that's an attorney's favorite phrase. It depends. Yeah. Um, so it really does depend though on the applicable law, how long someone's a temporary employee, whether or not they're going to come back, whether or not they're, you know, expected to come back. So it can, you know, it, but it depends. And it's not, it's not a one size fits all kind of thing, depending on their state, the statute, and the circumstances of an employee. This is sort of why we've structured it this way, where you have the number of employees at the top and just a list, because that's to trigger the, you to ask the question. Like, what is this law? What do I need to do to comply with it? And I wouldn't get too heavy handed in, do I have 15 or do I not? Because as Bill said, it's gonna depend on the law. Some of them like the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act have hours of service requirements. They have to have, the employee has to work there for 1250 hours or more in that particular year in order to be counted. Um, it, some of them have geographic span requirements. Some of them, you know, how you count employees together really depends. It starts to get a little bit, but that's to trigger you to ask the question. Is this something that applies to me? And if so, what do I need to do? Um, I saw another question that I thought was very good. Um, is it, Oh, shoot, I just lost it. I, I saw someone ask quickly just about uh, the entity you mentioned, Tara. So it's it's the Society for Hum Human Resources Management. So yes. SHRM. And you'll see they have a ton of stuff on there. Um, yeah. Um, one anonymous attendee says, can you, your job description and employee handbook legally require drug testing in the event of an on the job accident? That's going to depend on your state law. Um, most times, so you're, this is suspicion based drug testing. Um, most times in a lot of states, that would be fine. In Maine, that is not fine. In Maine, you have to get DOL approval of any drug testing policy, including a suspicion-based drug testing policy uh, in order to do any drug testing of employee. I, don't ask me why that's the law here. It's been the law here for years and I don't quite understand um, why they've heavily restricted drug testing, particularly in a situation like this where safety is at issue, but that's what they've done. So, um, that is kind of another kind of it depends on your state law, but for the most part, it, it's usually fine, but um, you should check your state law and drug testing. Making the time period of a specific employment opportunity explicit in the offer letter is fine to do. I saw somebody ask that question. Um, that may trigger for cause employment. If you don't have that caveat language that says this is at will, even if you say we're hiring you for the 2023 season, um, if you know, growing season, you, you can say there's a sp expected end date, but at any time we can choose to terminate you for any lawful reason. That's, that's gotta be explicit 
or the language about the season will be interpreted as overriding that at will relationship. From a cost perspective, one of the people, uh, that's a good question, what should we expect a lawyer to um, create an employee handbook and related policies? Depends on the lawyer. Um, Depends on where they are too. Yeah, some, some state laws are really, really complicated, but I, I will say for us, it generally runs about $2,000. That's about what I would say in terms of, I do some flat fee work, I do some hourly work and they end up being just about the same in my, I try to measure like how, how fair is this and if I'm outsized, um, but it usually runs for our offices about that. Yeah. All right, I'm looking, it's 112. So I don't know, do we wanna take one more and let people get on with their day? Let's see. Where can we find the right paperwork to hire our first employee? And how do we, and where do we file it? I think that's a good one to end on because it's a pretty good consolidation and review. I think you can start with the slides from this presentation. That's gonna give you a good um, overview of the paperwork. So um, you at the very least wanna have certain requirements. If this is your very first employee, you wanna have, you wanna look at workers' compensation you want to look at um, employment taxes and withholding. Um, so those are probably going to be found on your state DOL websites right. uh, or state workers' compensation board websites. Yeah. And so I, I did see someone ask about workers' comp. Um, I will say, depending on your area and what state you're in, workers' comp varies in terms of really whether fraud. or not you need it. So. It is, it is, it's a depends for that one as well. Um, so I, you know, I think what Tara also mentioned, take this, you can take this PowerPoint and you can make it into a checklist and you have a checklist for each employee of doing the same things, the methodical way of going about it. All great questions. I really hope that this was helpful for the people that are attending and thank you so much for paying attention. I know it's a beautiful day and for some of us anyway. <laughs> so thank you for, for attending. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Tara and Bill. We're we're right on time. We have until 1.15. So if any of those were burning questions, but um, I'll let you move on with your day as we've wrapped up. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.